Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to the OSPO contract here at Open Source Summit 2024, the last session of the day. Thank you for all of your patience and your continued attention. Uh, we are going to be presenting today a talk called Establishing a Baseline, Repository Maturity Models, Templates, Checklists, and Metrics. And that should be the right place if you're sitting in here. Uh, if not, then uh, stay tuned. So, uh, my name is Remy DeCosmaker, and I'm the open source lead at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services at the Digital Services at CMS. And I'm joined by my colleagues, and I will let them introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. My name is Natalia, and I am a U.S. Digital Core Fellow under the Software Engineering Track, and I'm part of the CMS OSPO. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Isaac Malarski. I'm also part of the U.S. Digital Core, part of the Software Engineering Track, and I work with Remy at the CMS OSPO. And super shout out to Ayat Ali. Hi, Ayat. Uh, Ayat is the reason why, well, future Ayat, who's going to be watching the video, she's not here with us today, but she's the <laughs> one who designed all the slides and is a product expert on our team. So uh, super thank you, Ayat, for all the beautiful work. And um, pictured, but uh, not totally pictured, are some Coding It Forward fellows who are going to be joining our program office this summer. CodingItForward.com is an internship program for uh, college students to get involved in civic technology. Uh, this will be our second season doing that work and is part of our early career talent pipeline efforts. So if you know any young people who are looking to get into civic tech, CodingItForward.com. And also if they're recent graduates, uh, DigitalCore.GSA.gov. So we've talked a little bit about it earlier today in our repository cohorts talk, but uh, there is a stack that we have been developing by we, I mean mostly Natalia and Isaac, uh, along with some volunteers from the United States Digital Response.org, uh, as well as folks from the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, this suite of tools is our baseline that we have been developing. So it starts with repository maturity models. Uh, the question that helps us answer is where is our project on our open source journey? Once you know where your project is at, we have templates. And those templates are basically the different files that should be in a repository to meet baseline standards of hygiene and compliance. It helps to answer questions like what files are required or recommended for a healthy repo? And then you can take those templates and put them in the checklist and say, what steps should our project take to release this repository publicly? And if you want a guided tour or sort of a command line assistant, we also have developed a tool called Cookie Cutter. Uh, Cookie Cutter is actually an upstream Python library, but we have a configuration file for it that will guide people through that process and help them select and find out what tier they're in and then populate each of their templates with the correct information about their project. And then lastly, once you have your baseline established, once you have your checklist and you've done all your work, how do you make sure that the repository stays in compliance and stays hygienic? RepoLinter is a project from the to-do group uh, that helps to check repositories for uh, creating rules to check them. So. Uh, this answers questions like what files or information are missing from the repository. And a uh, big shout out to our friends at the Comcast, OSPO, Chan, and Satwick. Uh, they recently mapped uh, repo linter configs to each level of our maturity models, which we're about to get into. And as an overview, we're going to talk a little bit about the OSPO. We're going to talk about how we grow the program. And we're going to talk about how we reduce work and reduce risk. So the digital service at CMS. We help to transform the healthcare system in the United States by deploying small, responsive groups of designers, engineering, product, and policy experts on a tour of duty alongside dedicated civil servants. And we bring industry best practices and fresh approaches to government modernization and help solve some of the most complex problems facing healthcare today. We serve a few people here in the United States. Uh, Medicare has about 65 million beneficiaries. Medicaid has about 88 million. There's about 31 million on healthcare.gov. These numbers are dated as 22 and 21, but I believe they have gone up since the last time we checked. 
Uh, how did that play out in numbers? The taxpayers that we serve, uh, it's about a $1.7 trillion budget. So about 12% of the federal budget goes through CMS, which amounts to about 800 billion plus Medicare payments and 650-ish billion Medicaid payments. And there are about 6,000 employees. We have about 1.4 million healthcare providers and this all corresponds to about 20% of the national healthcare spending is Medicare spending. So how do we do open source at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid? It sort of falls into three different categories. We have policies about how we inbound and outbound code and contributions. We have projects that help solve real world problems. And we have programs that help to measure and manage the contributions and projects and risks and opportunities that come along with that work. And when we think about how an OSPO provides value, it falls into a couple different categories. We're either saving money and time. We're either reducing duplicate work and duplicate cost. We're either reducing security risk and continuity risk, we're providing an engine for talent, or we're providing accountability for contractor and employee performance. And the being an engine for talent is how we grow the program. These, this slide, I'll take a moment if anyone wants to take a picture. Uh, these are the programs that we use to grow out the open source program office. Uh, I'm a member of the digital service, which is a four year tour of duty for engineering product design and data science. Uh, professionals. They started at GS13. The digital core, which Isaac and Natalia are members of, uh, start off at a GS9, go up to a GS12 over a two-year tour of duty. They get a recruitment incentive, and at the end, there's a full-time job waiting for you at the end of the rainbow, as long as you uh, meet your performance requirements. We already talked a little bit about coding it forward. Uh, those are a 10-week paid summer internship for currently enrolled or recent graduates. And also, we work with programs like the Urban Alliance, which is a six month part time to full time program paid internship and not pictured here is coding in the schools, which we have been talking with and exploring opportunities in the local Baltimore area in our backyard. And based on our work last year, uh, we had six interns and fellows, three of them through coding it forward, two through digital core, one through Urban Alliance. Uh, our demographics, five out of six identify as women and they all shipped about 12 open source repositories that they created in the past year. Um, or help to review that were created by contractors. Um, we like these numbers, we want to see these numbers grow. Uh, we'll give a talk maybe at a future conference and talk about what the numbers look like next after this summer. So ways that reduce duplicate work. We're gonna talk about maturity models and cookie cutter. And for that, I am going to pass the mic to Natalia. Hi everyone, so we first shared our maturity model framework back in GitHub Universe last year and we're excited to show you some update, some recent developments that we've made out of the framework. Okay, so our maturity model framework allows us to classify repositories based on their maturity level and where, where they are at at their open source journey. So in our framework, we have five tiers. Uh, the first tier is tier zero, which is a private repository where a project is kind of in its uh, experimental stage, and usually these are early prototypes. Then we have our tier one one-time release project, which is a project that we release publicly without any future plans of development or maintenance. So it's kind of out there as a reference implementation or for transparency accountability purposes. After that, we have our tier two close collaboration tier, where we have projects that have teams that work in an inner source style. Then we have tier three, which is working in public. This is an agency led project, either by choice or by statute, because sometimes we have legislation that require us to, um, to lead projects. And in these projects, we open up collaboration to um, the outside with accepting limited external contributions. And finally, our most mature tier is the community governance where we collaborate broadly in public. This is where we have a community-led mature open source project that has a open governance structure. Okay. And based on our maturity model tiers, we require certain files in the project as part of our repository hygiene and compliance. So as you can see in the table, we have a total of nine markdown files where M represents mandatory, R represents recommended, and N represents not recommended. If you guys are interested in learning more about our framework, you can find it in our GitHub released as, uh, as maturity-model-tiers markdown file. 
Awesome. And then after that, we decided to represent our maturity models as trees, with the lower tiers being small but mighty trees, and our higher level tiers being larger, deeper green trees with more layers and maintenance. And uh, shout out to Ayat for creating uh, this graphic. So to complement our maturity model framework and actually put it into action, we created a command line tool called Repo Scaffolder that uses cookie cutter. And it has two parts to it. So the first part is we have uh, the project team use our tool to determine what maturity model tier their project would be classified as. And to do this, we ask a series of five questions in this command line tool. So one, does your repository have more than one contributor? Do you plan on cutting more than one release? Do you plan on having other individuals or teams outside the agency work with you, maintain the project with you, and or develop the roadmap with you? And then from there, the tool outputs the result tier. Okay. And the second part of our repo scaffolder tool is that it adds the necessary documentation to new and existing open source projects so that it complies with our baseline standards. So beside each uh, tree tier are the files required for that specific maturity level. So uh, some things I wanna call out. So of course, all projects should have a license, a readme.md and a security.md. Starting from tier two onwards, we require community files such as communityguidelines.md and code of conduct.md. Um, at tier three, because we accept external contributions, this is where our code owners and maintainers.md come into play. And finally, for our tier four, um, we require the governance.md file. And in our repo scaffolder tool, how it works is that it asks the user to input information about the repository. So like, what is the name of the repository, a one sentence description, GitHub organization that it would be under. And after that, the tool will create a new project locally with the user input populated into those file templates. And, um, and the tool also has the functionality to upload and create a repository on github.com if uh, they have the GitHub token and the necessary permissions. And so overall, by having uh, our maturity model framework and these tools, we're able to reduce duplicate work for our projects going forward by having a baseline that all project teams can start off on. Okay. And our next section is we're gonna talk about how we reduce risk through our outbound checklist, metrics, and mentors. So for we, outbound, we have an outbound review process for private projects that would like to be released as open source. And in this process, we have eight, we have seven core steps. So first, we assess the benefits to open sourcing. Second, we assess the risk to open sourcing. Um, specifically, we ask in the checklist whether the project contains a personal identifiable information, PII, or PHI, personal health information or if it touches any of CMS's internal systems. And if they, uh, if they answer yes to any of those questions, then we would classify that as project as sensitive and that would require a more internal detailed review. After that, we have our code review and code analysis. We review the licensing, the documentation. We have sign off from um, key individuals of the, um, of the project. And finally, we flip the switch and we make the repository public. Um, these checklists we developed for our tier one, our tier three, and our tier four projects, and we have our tier two close collaboration checklist coming soon. And there are specific things that I would like to call out in this checklist. So one, as part of the code review and code analysis section of the checklist, we do offer a toolkit which allows, um, which allows the user to kind of use these tools as a way to review the code base. So we offer a selection of um, open source tools that they can use, such as Git leaks, where we can use that to discover any secrets or sensitive information in the repository. And we also have Git filter repo, which entirely removes files with sensitive data from the repository history. And we also have repo linter, which allows us to lint the repository for common files, which Isaac will talk more about. And um, second, we also have a checklist that reviews the documentation files in, 
that reviews the documentation files. And so uh, for each documentation file, we have specific sections and content that must be included. So for instance, in our README, we need to include um, our CMS open source policy, make sure that's there. So we also have our repo linter that would check for those sections as well, which Isaac will get into. And I will hand it off to Isaac to talk specifically more about our tier four checklist. Uh, our tier four checklist is made for outbounding projects that are sort of starting to get more mature, starting to get more of a governance structure and, 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 and collaborate more wildly. So uh, we have a, a couple more advanced features for our, uh, for our tier four. Uh, the most notable one being open SSF scorecard scanning being uh, uh, needed to be enabled to satisfy a, a tier four requirements. And the reasoning behind this is just because like, uh, as the project gets bigger, it becomes more of a, a federated project, more of a mature project, more bigger. Um, it's going to be harder and harder for individual contributors and, and maintainers to check everything that should be checked. And so it's important to take care of automated tools such as uh, open as a scorecard, um, GitHub Actions, and to, you know, um, sort of support that on the security side. A key feature of OpenSSF scorecard is that it will check to make sure that your GitHub workflows are not dangerous it will, um, and uh, other such stuff as that. Um, another uh, th other things that we, we want to enable for tier four are depend -to bot alerts, secret scanning alerts, branch protection, git branching, uh, repo linter, and DCO. All of these, uh, being included in tier four are, are pretty much for the same reason that OpenSSF scorecard is in tier four. These are all tools that make it much easier and much lower cost to maintain these large projects, um, especially stuff like uh, coherent Git branching, not having a million lines of uh, pull requests and all that. Um, a further measure that we do in order to uh, like uh, monitor our projects and, and make sure that uh, to maintain the coherence of our open source stack at CMS. Is, uh, we developed a metrics uh, front end and back end in order to uh, basically monitor and uh, provide a dashboard for uh, relevant open source projects here at CMS. And uh, we do this through GitHub pages and uh, GitHub actions as a very low cost, low maintenance way of doing that. Um, but the actual metrics and uh, whatnot is a, a Python script that could be called theoretically by non GitHub actions. So. It could be theoretically platform agnostic. But yeah, as you can see, here's the process of the backend at work. Um, all of the repos and groups that are desired to be scanned are currently uh, uh, defined in a project's track.json file. It's pretty easy to edit. You just drop in whatever you want and automatically populates all of the data. Um, and uh, it's all stored as JSON. And, um, and the good thing about that is the JSON is stored in the actual metrics repository. So you have a Git history of all of these uh, really relevant metrics and data. So you, you can go back and see the state of these things from, from, from whenever. Um, and we push these uh, metrics weekly. So we have a week by week um, comparison. Um, and from these uh, JSON files, we uh, uh, generate more advanced reports and graphs for our front end to use. And, uh, um, a good thing about that is we're utilizing upstream projects such as the Augur project and Chaos. Uh, this is uh, uh, good because we're uh, utilizing uh, metrics that theoretically anybody can use. We're uh, pushing metrics to Augur, uh, as we'll get into in just a second. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, you can check it out right here at uh, dsecms.github.io slash metrics. Here's what the front end looks like. Uh, we just released the V1 at uh, Open Source Summit North America. Feel free to check it out. Here's what it looks like. Uh, you can see a relevant uh, open source uh, GitHub organizations being displayed um, here. Uh, if you click on them, you get a nice org level report with uh, various metrics. We have a markdown table uh, of uh, various values with uh, percent uh, differences and, su and such from week to week. Uh, the connotations uh, are basically like what the desired behavior should be. So it's not just uh, uh, green mean up, uh, red mean down. It's green mean good, red mean bad. Um, and so, you know, you, you want more uh, uh, merge pull requests. You don't want more closed pull requests and all that. Um, but yeah, feel free to visit it. Um, and uh, I'll draw your attention to the red box there. That is uh, uh, circled the, a feature that we pushed to Augur called the Nadia. Uh, labels, which I'll uh, co uh, talk about further. 
Um, repository cohorts are an important concept that we worry about here at uh, the CMS OSPO. Um, basically, the, the tiers and, and, and basically further cohorts help to um, take a bunch of uh, uh, specific data about repositories and develop like simple, simpler to understand uh, metrics that basically uh, communicate a lot of information uh, without having to delve too deep into the weeds. Like, uh, and a key example of this is uh, um, is uh, Nadia labels developed by Nadia Asperanova in her book Working in Public, which you should totally check out. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's a taxonomy that she defined uh, based on uh, the high contributor growth, low contributor growth, and user and, and uh, uh, low, low and high user growth. And it basically tells you about the character of uh, open source repository relative to like how it's being contributed and, and uh, who's using it. Um, and it tells you basically like uh, you should be wary if you have a lot of stadiums in, in your stack or whatever, because uh, I know you guys are sick of hearing about the XE vulnerability, but this is very uh, relevant towards stuff like that. You, you, you'll know from, from labels like this whether or not you have a lot of users and only one burnt out developer and such stuff like that. And uh, further information on the Nadia labels can be found at projecttypes.github.io. Um, and we actually worked with uh, the Microsoft OSPO with uh, with uh, Justin Gosses and uh, Jim Siri, yep. yeah, Jim Jim Siri, um, to to uh, push this upstream to Augur so that so that anybody can use this, and I'll actually show the actual implementation that uh, Microsoft uh, uh, Microsoft uh, gave us and that we pushed to Augur, um, and uh, you can see all of the taxonomy that was defined in the previous slide, but there's an additional category called uh, contrib mid. Uh, this was added basically to not like force any repository into a category that's not really reflective of its character or development. Basically, like uh, we don't want to force any narrative that's not actually there uh, into the data. Um, but yeah, here's a handy link to the exact part of the Augur code that we implemented it in if you want to check it out. Uh, further on to reducing risk and basically like uh, checking the the, um, the state of our uh, open source uh, stack through uh, metrics, um, we use a, a tool called RepoLinter, developed by the To Do Group for checking repositories for common open source issues and predefined rule sets. This can be run standalone as a script, pre-commit or post-commit with a CI/CD system. We use GitHub Actions, but uh, in theory, you could use a different system. Um, and special thanks to Chan and Satwick at the Comcast OSPO. We have a repo linter JSON configs and rules that map to each T over open source repository maturity model. What's really cool about this is we're not just, you know, checking for presence of files, we're checking for content of files, we're checking for specific sections, specific uh, things. And uh, because uh, we have it all delineated by tiers, and, and basically we, we define a simple rule set and then extend and extend depending on the tier, um, we, we have a really efficient way of basically like, collating and, and, and creating like a, a linked map of all of the desired requirements for a repo. And uh, we, we utilize this uh, um, through cookie cutter to, to basically like construct the repo linter.json for new repositories that are being made. Um, and we actually uh, use repo linter as a GitHub action uh, here um, that automatically opens issues on the repositories on which it's enabled. Um, and so this way, it's easy for the maintainer or, or, or developer to look in and see it, a nice, uh, nicely formatted uh, uh, report on all of the things that they need to remediate regarding their uh, uh, tier uh, or, or, or the desired tier to, to potentially outbound. Great. So to go over what we've already covered today. Uh, all of these tools help to establish our baseline for where we want projects, communities, and repositories within the ecosystem inside of CMS uh, to get them to the best place where they have a chance to grow. Um, I've been at conferences like this and talked about uh, the three things you need to grow anything uh, being heat, light, and love. Uh, this. You can't guarantee when you plant a seed that that seed is going to grow, but you can do your best to make sure that the initial conditions like the t temperature and the moisture of the soil and the amount of sunlight that it can get 
are conducive to growth. And that's what these types of standards are all about. Um, we can't guarantee the project is going to go gangbusters and become a giant federation project, but we can make sure that you have a contributing file that makes it really easy for new contributors to find their way, and that you have a readme that's really informative of what the project is, and that you're part of our inventory of projects in open source so that when new contributors are looking for places to help, uh, it's easy to find you and it's easy to, to get there. So the maturity models set the tone for where you should be in your journey and where you might want to go. The templates provide the baseline for what files compose the hygiene. The checklists make it easy to follow and comply. Cookie cutter helps make it easy to populate those templates. And then Repolinter makes sure that those templates are implemented in the same way across as much of our ecosystem as possible. And that's how we built our baseline. And by we, I mean Natalia and Isaac and the volunteers from US Digital Core and Digital Response and HHS and the To Do Group and the Chaos Working Group and all the people that are listed on this slide. Um, we stand on the shoulders of giants. If it wasn't for folks like GSA and 18F and USDS and OMB and CFPB and all the folks who have been doing open source in the federal government for many years, uh, we would not, not to mention our friends in defense and other places have been presenting here at this conference, CISA. Um, without those folks, it would be a lot harder to explain the value and to help people get on board with this idea that repository hygiene is even something that you should be considering. So thank you to all those partners, especially US Digital Response. Uh, they have volunteers. Uh, so, you know, volunteer help is always appreciated. The chaos group, the to-do group, um, OSPO metrics working group meets weekly, monthly, something like that. Uh, so check out chaos.community if you want to join the Slack. And with that, we want to say thank you to all of our partners. Here is the contact slide. Um, one more time, uh, the folks here are public servants. Uh, if you know anybody else who wants to answer the call to help contribute to secure the supply chain for the United States and the world, uh, this is something that's been talked about a lot. Uh, we have the digital service, which is digital service at CMS, uh, cms.gov slash digital service. We have the digital core, digitalcore.gsa.gov, codingitforward.com, usdigitalresponse.org, chaos.community, todogroup.org, uh, all of our homies, all of our friends, thank you so much and everyone here in the audience. And uh, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you for being here. I saw a half hand. Thank you. We, like I said, it takes a village. So thank you to all of our partners and friends. Uh, we do it as a team and we ship upstream wherever we can so that if this is valuable to other people, we hope that they will use it. Um, our repository templates, we know that already we're getting some value signals. Um, shout out to the Department of Education. Uh, they actually released their first ever in history open source repository on GitHub earlier this month. Uh, they forked the repository templates that we had been using, and uh, that process was pretty painless. So it is our hope that by working with industry and academia and providing a model, other parts of the public sector can start to model from and contribute to and benefit from these types of approaches. So, you know, keep sharing in the open because you never know who you might influence over time. And that's github.com slash department, D-E-P-T of ed. Other questions? Right. 
Thanks, Sean. Yeah, absolutely. So the question was that um, cookie cutter asks five questions. And then if you answer yes to those questions, it tells you, okay, you do need a contributing.md file, for example. But each project is different and they might have different guidance or uh, ideas about how contributors should start. So in each of our tiers, um, it might even be worth pulling it up. If you want to pull up our repo scaffolder, like tier three or something. Um, the, we have sections that are recommended. So yeah, if you pull up the, uh, the table, the actual MD file on GitHub, we'll scroll down into the individual files. So not just whether you should have a contributing.md file or not, but we actually go through and we say, okay, in your readme, here are some typical headings that we recommend. So in the templates itself, if it's mandatory, when you get cookie cutter generates it, it generates it uncommented right in the file and you know you're supposed to fill it out. If it's recommended, it'll be commented out in the source and it'll say like, if this is something you're interested in, you can add it here. So we do try to say like, give people some suggestions and say, this is what the baseline is. If you wanna go above and beyond, here's what you should do. And if people are like, we don't need this, that's okay. Um, mandatory for security.md, for license and readme, those are really important. But for our one-time release projects, we say you can add this information to the readme if you want to, but you actually don't wanna give an expectation of maintenance if you're not gonna be cutting new releases. So we tell people not to do that sort of thing. And I think that one of the ways that other communities tackle this is by having like a user's file where they actually go through and say like, here's an example of somebody else's repo who's used this. And I think if we started keeping track, and this is me going off the fly, we need to file an issue on the repo for this after we get done talking. Uh, we should have like a user's file where we can say, here are all the repos that have used this. And then they can go through and look at those files for inspiration and say, okay, I like what this team did with their branching, or I like what they did with their issue templates, or I like what they're doing with their public meetings, right? So, you know, absolutely, this is meant to be a buffet. It's not meant to be a one size fits all thing. We wanna provide lots of values and plurality and just show people what's possible. But we set that baseline and say, this is the minimum that we want you to do. And if you can go above, great, here are examples. And this is our, you know, V1 release. Um, Natalia and Isaac joined the team in September of this year. So in that time, uh, we did have a version one of a metrics website. It was developed by our summer interns to start. So uh, shout out to Coding It Forward fellows from 2023. But really um, most of the, the repository repo scaffolder tool did not exist. Um, checklists. We had one version of it. We didn't have four tiers for it. So, you know, I am just so proud of the work that Natalia and Isaac have been doing. I think is really a testament to show that, you know, we need to trust in the future and bring in early career talent because this is the type of work that they are capable of doing. 
It is like the folks in the audience have been saying, it's done well. It uses industry best practices and we don't need to hire, you know, 20 year veterans at a million dollars an hour to do this. We can educate the next generation of hackers and we can deliver products that help people and solve real world problems and improve our future. Uh, a fun fact maybe is that we crunch the numbers on OMB and for every one citation needed, you can look up the data yourself. For every one employee under the age of 30 in the federal government, there are seven over the age of 60. So we are looking at a cliff and it is really important that engaging with these early career programs. So if, like I said, if you know young people in their career, if you know people in the middle of their career, we need all the help we can get. I showed you the budget slides earlier. I showed you the number of people that depend on this code. Something like three to 5% of the GDP goes through healthcare.gov like every month or year or something like that. Again, citation needed. Shouldn't be throwing out statistics willy nilly like this, but the scale is, is large. And it is really inspiring to have folks like Natalia and Isaac choosing to start their career in public service and doing work like this and partnering with folks like you. So big shout out to the Digital Core. Thank you everyone for being here. How much time do we have left? I don't even have a clock in front of me. Wow, we got 13 minutes left. It is the last talk of the day. So any last minute takers for questions? <laughs>